Well, good morning. Why don't you stand and sing that with us? Oh, come on now, y'all. Smile. A lot of people. Smile. Good morning. Wow. All right, here we go. Ready? Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children in his own. He carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him. Tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Ever in joyful song. You may be seated. Good morning, Lakeview. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, if you're a new guest with us this morning, I would invite you to take out your device and text 765-222-5937, and that's how you will access our communicator card, and we would ask that you would uh, take the time to complete that and let us know of your involvement with us today. Again, 765-222-5937 for new guests, but we welcome everyone here this morning and uh, glad that you're in this warm place together with us this morning. Well, today is the last Sunday of Pastor Appreciation Month, but it does not mean the end of Pastor Appreciation, does it? Uh, which goes on, or does it? No, oh, no, no. I just want to make sure you're with me there. Uh, so after today, and we're going to recognize Pastor Chris in just a moment, but after today, I would encourage you to keep praying for our pastors, as you have been, but appreciate them that way. I know prayer is important to them. Send them a text, send them an email, show up at their house with a big caravan of people and just surprise them. Just do all sorts of fun things with them to let them know you love them, they mean something to you, and you're, uh, they're on your mind all the time. So that's how we can keep appreciating our pastors and, uh, and even give some money once in a while, right? Would you be all right with that? So... All right, but uh, and we've had some fun every Sunday, if you've been here, uh, recognizing our pastoral staff, and today it's Pastor Chris, so our, our lead pastor. Come on up, brother. And, uh, you know, Pastor Chris, about a year ago, um, we were in the midst of a pastoral search, and uh, there was nine of us on this committee, and we hadn't even posted the job description at this time last year. And little did we know the fun that we would be having uh, <laughs> leading up until springtime, until you were hired, that God sent you our way. 48 applicants, but, um, uh, you know, I just got to say this, that uh, I am so glad, and I know I speak, uh, that the committee still, it's the, the, that process is still fresh in our minds, at least it was mine, about how we sought and we prayed, that committee worked well together, and uh, you kind of rose to this top like sweet cream, you know, and uh, that's cheesy, I know. Well, enough with the Wisconsin stuff, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, here you are, and uh, we're going to have some fun with you here, getting to know you a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Pastor Chris, tell us, where are you from? Yeah. So I grew up on the East Coast. I was born, uh, lived a little bit of time in Laurel, Delaware, and then we moved like a road over, and that was Seaford, Delaware. So kind of right on the line between Laurel and Seaford and kind of grew up on the East Coast. So, East Coast person. Yeah. You like lobster? Yeah. Uh, you know, we're more mid-Atlantic, so uh, okay. uh, Maryland blue crabs Maryland more blue than crabs. lobster. That but I'll eat a lobster any time. That so, wasn't one of yeah. the questions, but yeah. I just wanted to know. <coughs> So how long have you been married, Pastor Chris? Uh, we've been married, it'll be 23 years uh, in April. So, All right. Yeah. Married to? Marita. Marita. Yep, she got married right on this platform. She She's did. actually not here today because our daughter's doing a college visit this weekend in Tennessee. So, yeah. Okay, Pastor Chris, uh, what is something that most people don't know about you or share with us a fun fact about you? Yeah, so when I was a kid, I loved this show called The Dukes of Hazard. I don't know if anybody's ever watched that show, but uh, 
I just thought it would be cool to be like Bo and Luke Duke. And so I used to roll the windows down in my mom's car and try to slide across the hood and jump in the window of the car. It never worked very well, but uh, it was a lot, a lot of fun to try. So that was kind of my uh, fun thing when I was a kid. So I think you could do that. Try that. <laughs> no, I think no. it might go worse today. Okay, so. All right. <clears throat> uh, favorite movie or TV show besides Dukes of Hazard? Yeah, so favorite TV show, bar none, Person of Interest. Jim Caviezel uh, starred in that show. Just a fantastic show. Uh, so I love that as a show. Uh, movies, this is a tight race between Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, and Lord of the Rings trilogy. It kind of just depends on the day of the week that uh, you'd ask me that I'd give one of those answers. All right. <coughs> uh, so what's your favorite place that you have been to, to in, as a vacation or that you visited? Uh, so love Edinburgh, Scotland. That is probably my bar none favorite place in the world that I've been to so far. Uh, and then every summer, my family and I, we visit a lake up in Wisconsin uh, my in-laws have a home on a lake uh, just outside of Bloomer, Wisconsin, and uh, just love going up there and sitting, looking over the water, and uh, reading as much as I possibly can, and consuming lots of coffee while I'm there. So, All right, so what would you do with a million dollars, of course, besides tithing the first yeah, 10%? Yeah, yeah. Uh, every single dollar that I've ever made in my life, the first 10% has always gone to the church, so if I got a million dollars the 10% would clearly go to the church. But after that, uh, I would pay off our debt. Uh, I would fund college for my kids. And then, without question, I would go buy a U-long white metallic Range Rover with ebony and tan interior. And then I would just enjoy driving all around in that vehicle because I have so long wanted a Range Rover. So... Uh, that would clearly be what I would do. And then after that, I would buy tickets to every remaining NHL arena that I have not yet been to. I think we have 18 left to go to. And so I'd buy tickets for me and my boys, and we would be on the glass 100% uh, and enjoy uh, going to those games as well. You thought so. about winning a million dollars. Oh, 100%. Lot, every, every day. I, I just, you know. Just think on it and pray on it and hope on it. And so, yeah. So, a Range sure. Rover. Uh, yeah. Might I remind you, today is Pastor Appreciation yeah. Day. If yeah. any of you yeah. have it in your heart, I could start a GoFundMe if that would be helpful. So, yeah. All right. Pastor Chris, what career would you have if you were not called into ministry? I would clearly be the CEO of Apple, 100%. <laughs> Uh, if I was not a pastor, Steve would have handed the reins to me before he left this earth, and uh, that would have been my job. You and him for sure. are pretty. Yeah, you were yeah. pretty tight. I understand him. Okay. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> a person from the Bible you most relate to, and why? Uh, the Apostle Paul is probably my favorite all-time Bible character because he had a heart to extend the church into places where it currently doesn't exist. And he was committed to raising up leaders in every one of those locations and empowering them to lead the church. So he was able to do that and then move on. And I just love that emphasis of extending the reach of the church into new places and then, and then developing and empowering leaders to lead the church forward in that place. So. Excellent. Very good. Uh, current Bible verse or favorite Bible verse? Yeah, this is my life verse, uh, Mark chapter 3, uh, verse 14. This is the verse where Jesus appoints 12 apostles, and he says that he appointed them to be with him so that he could send them out to preach. And I just uh, have claimed that verse as my life verse because it reminds me that before I go do ministry for God, my first ministry is to be with God. Uh, I think that is the most important gift that I give to my family. It's the most important gift that I give to you as a church to make sure that I am walking tightly and intimately with the Lord before I try to go out and do anything with you or for you uh, or for this church, that I would be with God before I minister on his behalf. All right. Very good. So what do you love most about Lakeview? 
Man, every single day I get to wake up and I get to uh, do what God has called and equipped me to do. So I get to develop, lead, and equip God's people here in this location uh, so that leaders in this church can thrive. We as a congregation can reach our top potential in God's kingdom and our community and our world can become different and better. And knowing that I get to spend every single day doing that kind of work is what I love about being your pastor. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. Excellent. And finally, uh, your favorite candy bar. Oh, uh, just plain and simple Hershey's uh, ch chocolate candy bar. Uh, just love those. They're so great uh, because you can just put them in the freezer and they just are so perfect when they're frozen. So with a cup of coffee, it's amazing. Well, so. guess what I just so happen to have oh, here, Pastor I, Chris? I love you, Bob. Sure. I love you. So here's a fresh <coughs> bag of uh, Hershey Minis. But last oh. week you told about us bringing candy to give to Kayla. So here's your contribution to Kayla. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> good. Well, the good news is, is that we're actually a host home for the upcoming trunk or treat that's decentralized. So I'm just going to claim this for our house. And that way Kayla doesn't even have to touch it. It'll just be less work for her. So. Okay. Good job. Hey, Pastor Chris, we, we want to pray over you. Now, uh, you have a group of men in the church that uh, thirty men that pray over you one each one man each day of the month. Yeah. I'm going to actually invite some of those men to come up. I didn't let you know this, but if you're on the pastor's prayer force and want to come up, and we're going to pray over Pastor Chris as uh, men and all of us pray. But would you have a a, a knee at the altar, please? And uh, Pastor Chris shared these things to pray for with the men that uh, pray for him, and I want us to all pray over him this way. First of all, intimacy with God. That's his desire for him personally. Protection from the evil one. As the leader of our church, you know that that's important. Uh, he wants us to also, he wants us men and everyone to pray over his doctoral work. That's an important part of his life. He continues in that. And finally, for wisdom. That's his personal prayer request. And then, of course, the biggest thing besides uh, his wife that's on his mind is the church. And so he's uh, asked for prayer for vision, unity, and courage, which we all uh, know too well that we're all praying about. The vision team that we're in the midst of, uh, conversions and baptisms, those are dear to Pastor Chris's uh, heart. And then uh, the message series that uh, not only we're in the midst of, but upcoming as well. So those things for the church. And so uh, would you join me together in praying over Pastor Chris and, and men, let's join in prayer. Lord, we thank you for uh, Pastor Chris, our lead pastor. We thank you, God, for bringing them to us in the right time. Lord, uh, thank you, Lord, that you identified him. And he even had an, an idea that uh, you were calling him, Lord. And so thank you. We do pray for these matters over Pastor Chris. We pray, God, for his intimacy with you, Lord, that he discovers new and fresh things each day about you, Lord, that it would just help him to become more like Jesus every day. And, Lord, his faith would be so fresh every day. We pray for your protection over him as well. We know the devil wants to bring him down, does not like that he's our lead pastor, and will do what he can to tempt him and to interfere and to distract him from the work at hand here. So we pray in Jesus' name for your protection over him, and we pray that Jesus would win always in his life and the devil would lose. God, we pray for uh, wisdom, that he would have the wisdom of God as he discerns things and leads our church, Lord. Um, we depend a lot on his leadership here, and so, Lord, we ask that you would grant him godly wisdom for everything that he experiences. And then, Lord, for matters with the church, we do pray uh, for his heart's desires for the message series, for the vision team, uh, Lord, for baptisms and conversions for our church. Lord, we want to be a church that's on a cutting edge for the kingdom. And I know past, that's Pastor Chris's heart as well. And so, Lord, we pray for those things for Lakeview and, uh, again, for Pastor Chris as he leads us. Lord, so thank you for um, pastor appreciation. We certainly appreciate the man of God that you have brought to us to lead this church. And uh, it's in the name of Jesus that I lift these things up. Amen. All right. 
Let's stand. Smile. Even if you have a mask on, you can smile. I tell my students at school, although I haven't seen them for a week, I tell them that I can tell if you're smiling with a mask on by your eyes. And they just look at me and they say, Mr. Huff, you don't smile. Oh, I don't. But I'm the teacher. And I get to be in charge. Let's sing together and strength the rise as we wait.
together this morning. God, we come before you in this moment, and we are so very grateful that we get to be together on this day. God, whether we're here in this room or whether we're watching from wherever we have our device in front of us today, God, we are a church that is not forgetting about your command to assemble together, to gather even more so as we see the day approaching so that we can encourage one another and strengthen one another and encourage one another to to love and to good deeds. So I pray, God, that as we gather in this worship service, that we would be aware of the blessing that it is today to be together in this place. God, I want to thank you for being our solid rock. In this world that we are living in today, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's filled with ambiguity. And God, we find ourselves as if we're on shaky ground all of the time. And yet we are reminded as your people, on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. Jesus doesn't shift or change. He doesn't move with the culture. He doesn't doesn't flip-flop with the world. No, he is solid and stable and steady from age to age to age. And we are grateful today that we can stand on you. God, in the midst of the day and age that we find ourselves, we know that we are in the middle of a divisive political season as we move towards election day. So we are praying, God, for your peace to settle into our city, into our county, to our state, and to our nation during these days. Would you please guide us and direct us as a people? Would you unify us as a nation? And would you help this country to return to you. God, while we're praying for your hand to be upon the election, more importantly than that, we are praying for a revival in our nation. We are praying for an awakening in our country. So please, God, do a new, fresh work in the United States of America and let it move beyond our nation around the world. Please, God, do a new work. And God, We think about not only this political season that we find ourselves in, but we know that we are navigating, continue to navigate COVID-19. And God, we realize in our own community that there are people in our church who have been touched by this this virus. We know, God, that the cases are on the rise in our county and in our state and really around our country right now. So we are again praying, God, for your hand to just settle down upon this situation. Please stop the spread of this virus. For those who are currently suffering from it, would you bring healing and recovery and wholeness? And would you continue, God, to guide and direct our leaders as they make wise decisions for what we need to do next to navigate the situation that we find ourselves in? And then, God, we remember today that some in our congregation are are fighting disease, not not just COVID, but other diseases. So we think today of Gail Simmons, and we lift him to you. We think of Carolyn Lewis, and we lift her to you. We think of Dwayne Kelly, we lift him to you. God, we're asking for you to touch these that we have named and those that have not been named in this service but are struggling today with sickness and disease. Please provide your healing touch for these members of our congregation, members of our community who need a touch from you. And then God, we're thinking about the future that you're calling us to pursue as a church. And we're grateful, God, that you have a future for us as a congregation. We sense it, Lord. We sense that you are giving us a vision for the future. Continue, God, to give us a clear picture of who you want us to be and what you want us to do for your name and your cause unify us as a congregation around that picture of the future. Make us a congregation with one heart and one mind, one purpose, to bring glory and honor to your name by doing what you've given us to do. And God, give us spirit-inspired courage today to do whatever it is you are asking us to do so that we would be quick to obey, quick to fulfill that which you are calling us to so that you can be glorified and honored in our community and in our world. 
through the way that we live our lives for you. God, you are a good, good God. And we lift these prayers to you knowing that you have heard these prayers because you are here in our midst. And so God, as we continue to worship you this morning, I pray that you would make yourself known to us through the singing, through the preaching of your word, and through the grace that you will give to us through the table of the Lord this morning. Please, God, make yourself known to us as we continue to lift you up in this place. We pray these things today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
stand for the reading of the scripture this morning, and then Pastor Darrell will come. It comes out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the, the time to worship both through music and then through the reading of your scripture. Father, we ask that you would give Pastor Jared the words that you have for us. And that we would be people that would receive them and apply them to our lives, Father. We love you, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I have the privilege of capping off our rock solid series. We've covered a lot of ground, haven't we? Pastor Jessica started us off telling us how we can build a rock solid life on Jesus Christ that will weather the storms of this life. This life. I preached about how you can put on the new self. Pastor Lenny preached about how we should open the aperture of our heart so that Christ's light can shine in. Pastor Chris preached on reconciliation. He preached on how we needed faith that's both wide in our evangelistic mindset and deep in our discipleship. And he also talked about how we should move from a self-centered mindset to a mission-centered mindset. And just last week, Pastor Jessica talked to us about how we can find our part in God's grand master plan. So you figured out how to do all that, right? You're now a rock-solid Christian, I hope. So the holidays are just around the corner, and so is that spare tire that doesn't look as good on us as it does on a Jeep Wrangler, right? And soon we'll be able to be enticed by ads that say the following things. Get the gym body without going to the gym. Get high school skinny. Lose 20 pounds a week, guaranteed. Get shredded abs fast. Our undergarments will destroy your fat cells. Just take this pill, do this exercise, buy this article piece of our clothing, drink this shake, pour this on your food, sell us your soul. It's that easy. No effort, no sweat. You'll shred the pounds, right? Wouldn't it be nice if there was something like that in the Christian life that didn't require a lot of effort but had great results? Could there be some sort of cheat code, some sort of shortcut like that in the Christian life? 
We've covered a lot of ground, like I've said. And so much ground even that it seems overwhelming. Is there one thing that we could focus on in the midst of that that would guarantee us massive spiritual results? So I want to scan with you through the book of Ephesians and see if we can find it. So the first thing that comes to my mind is if we're looking for this shortcut, is Ephesians chapter 4. Paul talks about how we are to live a manner worthy of the calling to which we're called. And two, in chapter 1, Paul talks about how we've obtained an inheritance and we've been predestined according to God's great purpose. So to me, this sounds like we've already got a whole bunch of power in our hands. God has already granted us something. So maybe, just maybe, the secret is that I need to trick myself that I am mature when I'm not. I just need to claim it, right? I just need to convince myself. It's just simple psycho-spiritual gymnastics. I just need to convince myself that I'm more mature than I am. But now that I'm saying that out loud, that doesn't sound like such a great idea. So maybe that one's off the list. So not name it, claim it. But we talked a lot in this series about unity. In fact, Pastor Chris had a whole sermon just dealing with reconciliation. But even in the rest of the sermons, we brought up the idea of how the Jews and the Gentiles were supposed to unite in the family of God. And so what if the answer The shortcut to spiritual growth is just focusing on unity. We just need to have a pizza party and quit having all of our petty arguments and get together. Be unified. And you know, that does make sense, right? Because when we're in a team, when we're unified, we have accountability. We have encouragement. But then again, there are a lot of people who are really close-knit but are still just as complacent as they were when they were individually alone. Okay, but we didn't really go into depth about the armor of God, and that's at the end of the book. Pastor Jessica referenced it, but we didn't like get down into the nitty-gritty with this. So maybe the answer is that I need to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. I've got to really tighten this, the belt of truth after all the carrot cake that you gave me for Pastor Appreciation Month, and the gospel of peace the sandals of the gospel of peace, and the, sh- the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith. So if I just focus on my salvation, focus on my righteousness that Christ has given me, focus on his gospel, focus on his truth, now that I'm saying that out loud, it might be effective, but that's a lot to remember. That's a little more effort than I really want to put in. So maybe that's not the shortcut either. Okay, but we did talk about just one article of clothing, the new self. That, that's just a little bit easier, right? I just need to focus on putting on the new self. Just try a little harder to put on the new self and put away the old self. But now that I'm thinking about it, this kind of sounds like the cycle that I've always been in, maybe that you have found yourself in, where it's like, well, just quit it or just do it. And we respond, well, you don't understand. It's not that easy. Just do it. It's not that easy. So is there an answer? Is there a shortcut in this book or not? But Pastor Jessica did just preach last week on this verse how Paul talks about he has a specific grace, a specific calling in his life. And a specific calling is to preach the gospel to the whole world, not just to the Jews, but to let the ends of the earth know of the riches of Christ, of Christ's wisdom. And you know, Paul seems to do pretty good in this position. So maybe the answer is I need to find my calling, my role, and then I'll thrive. I need to get in the right place. I mean, at the end of the book, Paul does talk about different roles in the family, too. I know that's not exactly the same as calling, but if I just figure out my place in this world, then I'll spiritually grow, won't I? But then again, once again, there are a lot of people who are in their role, are in the place where God has called them, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily growing. But this word grace keeps coming up over and over and over in this book. We have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. By grace you have been saved. By God's grace given to me. Grace was given to each one of us. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. 
grace upon grace upon grace. Paul says it 12 times in the whole letter. That's enough for each one of the disciples. That's enough to cover over a whole box of donuts from poppies. That's a lot of grace. Paul keeps saying it over and over and over. And the thing that catches my eye about this is that the nature of grace is that it's a gift. It's not something I've earned. You know, all these other examples that we've looked at in Ephesians have been talking about trying. You just need to try harder to put on the new self. You just need to try harder to be more unified. You just need to try harder to do this, and then you'll grow. This doesn't seem to be the case. The nature of grace is that it's a gift. It's not an award from accomplishment. Grace saved us. Grace gave us a calling, and we didn't even have to try harder. That sounds pretty easy to me, right? That's because grace leads to spiritual growth. Grace leads to spiritual growth. Not trying harder, just more grace. Believing that you can do any of this without God's help, Anything that God has asked you to do, anything that calling that God has put on your life without God's help is heresy. It's something called Pelagianism. You can never do it without the Lord. But the question is, if grace is the answer to spiritual growth, if this is the secret, the get spiritually fit quick scheme, then how do I get it? You see, directly preceding this prayer that we're focusing on today that Josh read for us, Again, Paul is talking about how his calling is to preach to the whole world the riches of the gospel of Christ, right? And then he starts off this section in this prayer. For this reason, I pray. In other words, as a result of the fact that I have this calling, as a result of the fact that I have this gift, this grace in my life, I'm praying. And he never says grace in this whole section, 14 through 21, but he's talking about grace. He doesn't have to say it out loud for it to be grace. Listen to this. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, that you may have the strength to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to his power at work within us. If we're to know the love of Christ, if we're to be filled with the fullness of God, that's not something that can come as a result of us trying harder. That's something that can only come by the grace of God. So grace saves Paul by faith. Grace gives Paul a calling, and then Paul asks for grace to fulfill that calling, and then even concludes the letter, if you turn to the last chapter, asking that the Ephesians pray for him so that he might have words to spread the gospel. Not Again, not saying the word grace, but asking for grace to be poured out in his life. The only reason that Paul authored most of the New Testament, the only reason that Paul is remembered to us today as a saint in the church is not because he was great within himself, but because he relied on God's grace over and over and over. It didn't matter how far he got in his walk. He was always saying, Lord, I need your grace. Pray for grace for me. And this is because grace is given to those who admit their need for it and then ask for it. Grace is given to those who admit their need for it and ask for it. And the primary means of recognizing our need for grace and then asking for it is prayer. Prayer doesn't guarantee grace, but it seems like a pretty surefire way to go after it. I love this quote from Thomas Oden, a famous theologian who says this, quote, God does not withhold from sinners sufficient grace to resist temptation and repent when they sin. The defect lies not in the grace of God, but in the sinner who refuses or neglects the means of grace. No sinner is without the grace of prayer, the exercise of which enables further strengthening by grace. Unquote. God's grace 
is inexhaustible. The question isn't whether there's enough available for you to be transformed into the person God has called you to be. The question is whether or not you're humble enough to recognize it and then ask for it. But you see, something peculiar happens in the church, even in the Protestant church that has championed this idea that we are saved by grace and not by works. That's Ephesians, by the way, right? We just talked about that earlier. But for some reason, we get people saved, and then there's like this unspoken rule. It seems like we just leave grace at the door. It's like now that you're in, grace was special. You had that special moment with the Lord when he led him to yourself, when you, you were led to him, rather. But... Now that you're here, you need to try harder to be like Christ. It's in you. You can do it. Come on now. But then my mind is brought to this scene, this famous scene in the book, the film, Oliver Twist. So if you've never seen it, if you've never read it, Oliver Twist is about an orphan, ends up in an orphanage, and he is eating porridge with his friends. He only gets one bowl, and he goes up to the server and says, please, sir, I want some more. And what's the response? More? <laughs> In other words, you shouldn't need any more. You've had enough. But deep down inside of all of us, whether we believe it or not, there's a little Oliver Twist saying, please, sir, I want some more. Please, sir. I need some more. If I have any chance of doing the things that you have asked me to do, of doing the things you've called me to do, I need your grace. You had to ask for grace to be saved. Why shouldn't you have to ask for grace as you continually walk with Christ, as you are continually sanctified? as you continually grow in Christ's likeness. The truth of the Christian life is that it's a never-ending journey of recognizing our need for God's grace and asking for it. And while self-control, discipline, and self-denial are hailed as Christian virtues, God is much more satisfied with you being a glutton of his grace than he is of you being a glutton of your effort. But isn't that cheating? Isn't that not okay to use God's power to do God's will? It's the only way. It's not cheating. So are you lacking unity? There's grace for that. Are you failing to put on the new self? There's grace for that. Are you failing to let Christ's light shine into your heart? There's grace for that. Are you failing to know God's part for you in his grand master plan? There's grace for that. There's grace for all of it. You just have to ask for it. So what's the secret? What's the shortcut to spiritual growth? The posture of prayer. The posture of recognizing our need for grace and then asking for it. Mature Christians are grace gluttons. They've been cheating the whole time by using God's grace to accomplish God's will. Prayer is the place to ask for grace. Prayer is the place to ask for grace. It's the appropriate place to say, please, sir, I want some more. Please, God, I need some more grace. If I am ever able to do what you've asked me to do, it will only be by the power of you that is at work within me. You're not going to reach maturity without a prayer life with like that. If you're missing it in your spiritual diet, then you're malnourished, you're stunted, you're probably stuck. So what's the application to this message? It's really quite simple. Prayer. Are you regularly going before the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't have enough in me to do what you've asked, and I need your power? I'm not talking about your normal, you know, pray, bless his food. I'm asking you, do you regularly go before the Lord and say, please, sir, I want some more of you? I want some more of your power. I want to be more like Christ, and I can't do it without your power. Is that a part of your life? But sometimes we get intimidated. We think about people like Martin Luther who prayed for three hours a day, or John Wesley who prayed for two hours a day, and we're like, yeah, I can't do that. So it doesn't have to be anything crazy. 
It's just a regular practice of going before the Lord. It could be five minutes. You just attach it to brushing your teeth, when your morning routine, when you're doing your hair, when you're getting ready for bed, something, just a place within your day where you open up your hands and say, please, God, I want some more. And not only for you, but for other people as well, because that's what Paul did. He recognized his own need for grace, asked for it, asked for other people to pray for him, but was also praying for grace to be poured out on other people's lives. So not only asking for grace in your life, but asking that he might transform this whole earth by his grace into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And what a more perfect day to talk about the continual need to ask for grace than a communion Sunday as I invite the worship team up as we draw to a close in this sermon. Communion, like prayer, is what we call a means of grace. A place where we humble ourselves before the Lord, asking that he would pour out his grace on us. And so if you also do not have communion elements at this time, raise your hand and our ushers will get them to you. It's a place where we recognize that we continually need to be filled with Christ so that we might act in Christ-likeness. It's never something that we can do on our own. And so as we pray and consecrate these elements, let this be an act, a response, through which we might offer ourselves before the Lord, recognize our need for his grace, and receive it. Let's pray. Lord, may we consecrate these elements and use this as an opportunity for you to grant us grace we are hopeless to please you without. Transform our hearts today and fill us with Christ's likeness so that the whole world may know your loving heart. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Partake in the bread portion of the elements. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood in the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Partake in the juice. Now that we've partaken in the grace of communion, I want to challenge you today. If you feel the Spirit stirring within your heart, saying, yes, that's me. Yes, I, there is a little Oliver Twist in me saying, please, God, I want some more. The altar is open as the worship team plays the song, Give Me Faith. And may your prayer be, Lord, give me faith in your grace. Give me faithfulness in asking for your grace in my life and in others. The altar is open. And God's grace is overwhelmingly available. Come as you feel led. I need you.
but your spirit's strong in me. so grateful for your grace, unlimited grace. It never runs out. It never runs dry. It never goes away. Lord, thank you not only for your grace, but for your word, which makes your grace known to us so that we can understand it, so that we can know, God, what it means for us to posture ourselves in a way to receive grace so that we might grow. Lord, for those who came for prayer this morning, Lord, I just pray that you would be with each and every one of my brothers and sisters today. Give them faith, pour out wave after wave after wave of grace upon their lives. And God, I pray that for all of us here in the room and those watching online, may we sense Fresh new waves of grace pouring over our lives, even in this very moment. Give us the faith, God, to trust you for that grace. And for all that you do, God, we're going to give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to share the benediction and send us out of this place. But before I do, I want to just let you know about a couple of things. One... Uh, If you do have candy that you've brought for the trunk or treat, we just encourage you to leave that at the Welcome Center. If you forgot to bring candy or are right now just feeling convicted that that's the thing you're supposed to do this week, you can just bring it to the church office. Uh, We'd love to have candy that we can distribute to our homes all across our community that are going to be welcoming kids Uh, this uh, next week for uh, Trunk or Treat. So we'd encourage you to do that. Also, I want to let you know that we have baptism coming up on November 22nd, and we are so excited. We've got several people who want to be baptized, and we're excited uh, to baptize them at that point. But you might be here today, and you've never uh, been baptized. Maybe you're a new believer. Maybe you've been a believer for a little while, but you've never been baptized. Coming up on November 15th, we have a baptism class. And we would invite you to be a part of that. So you can sign up for that. We would encourage you to do that. You're going to hear more about that over the next couple of weeks. But we want you to sign up for the baptism class so you can learn more about it. And then we would love to have the opportunity uh, to baptize you on November 22nd. So again, if you have questions, you can see me. You can see Pastor Jared. We'd love to help you with that uh, coming up here very soon in the next few weeks. So I want to invite you to stand with me as we receive the benediction uh, from this morning's service. I'm going to use the same benediction I used last week because it comes right out of the passage that we're looking at this morning. So receive these good words from God. Now to him who is able to do abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. As you go from this place today, go in his power and let him bring glory to himself through you. You are sent out.